Je me suis Zizou. Je suis le petit-fils de Zizel. Zizel, c'était ma grand-mère, sataniste et gaffomane. Mais alors, depuis qu'elle a été enterrée vivante par accident, elle hante le royaume, le royaume des gens. Et elle me fait faire des choses dégueulasses. Elle me possède, elle me martyrise. Elle n'en peut plus. Et parfois, je regarde son cercueil, elle est morte dedans. Mais je vois son cercueil bouger. Ah, il a bougé. Non, il a pas bougé. Il a bougé Non. Ah 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 Elle a Ah Non Elle revient Elle revient Ah Elle revient Elle Ah 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 la Gisèle ah Elle fait trop peur. Gisèle ah Elle est partie Elle est partie par là Elle est partie par là Elle est partie par là Vous l'avez vu Oui, on l'a vu, mais là, elle est partie. Non, là-bas, là-bas. Elle est partie par là Elle est dedans Elle est dedans. Tu crois qu'elle est dedans Elle est dedans. Welcome to Kuvulu, the sorcery of copper. In this episode, I'll show you a small device I've built, the strobe controller. I have a couple of friends which from time to time like to organize really great Halloween parties with creepy games and frightening attractions. And in one of them, a ghost appears. So what better to make the victim scream than a scare jump, like in horror movies. For that, we needed to be able to control the light and have a short strobe of light right when the ghost was in front of them. And it worked out really well, better than expected. So let's see how this device is made. The first thing we need is some source of light. Normally in electronic projects, I will use LEDs. The problem with these LEDs is they are quite dim. They don't provide a lot of power, only a couple of milliwatts. Instead, we will use a floodlight. Up. And as you can see, this floodlight is 30 watt, so it is bright enough to light a complete room. Uh, floodlights are often found on construction sites, and you can buy them from um, Home Depots, so they're quite ubiquitous. Actually, these floodlights are even LED floodlights. If you see here in the details, all these elements here are actually LEDs, each single one of them. And these are mounted on something which is called a chip on board. Using LEDs in floodlines has a lot of advantages. First, LEDs can be switched on and off really fast compared to tungsten or halogen or HQI bulbs, which don't like to be switched on and off very frequently. Now, this will be the slowest element. While the LEDs can be switched on and off really fast, this transformer, which takes um, power from the AC in and then drives the LEDs at 600 milliampères constant current, this will be the slow element, but this is fast enough to create um, strobes of light. Um, other advantages are that LEDs are very small, so this is just the chip on board element, it doesn't take a lot of space, so this makes the floodlight very slim, very compact, very light also, and very robust. So with that we can mount it into corner, into ceilings, and it's perfect for temporary installations where we need to provide some strobe of light. Plus, LED strobe lights are now getting very cheap so and ubiquitous, so there's no need for us to use anything else and this fits perfectly on need. To switch on and off LEDs or other devices in electronics, we very often use transistors. The problem with these tiny transistors is that they can only cope with a couple of volts and they can only support a couple of milliamps or milliwatts, so this will not last for the huge 30 watt LED. But the main problem is that these are designed to be used with DC current, the problem or DC voltages. And the problem is that the floodlight takes AC as input. So instead of using transistors, what we need to use are relays. And as you can see, they 
support 10 amps which is a lot of current but also 250 volts ac how to use relay well on one side you have three pins which are generally marked com and c and no com stands for common this is where actually the power will come into and c stands for normally closed so whenever the relay is not activated the, the common pin is connected to the normally closed pin and this is why we see that this LED is activated. The power from the battery pack comes into the plus, goes out to the normally closed because the relay is not powered, goes through the LED and then back to the power pack using the negative lead. Now on the other side we have 5 volt because this is a 5 volt DC controlled relay. We have ground and then we have the input pin and if we pull the input pin low we see that we activate the relay and the common pin is now connected to the normally open because whenever this is not powered this is normally open and now we see that the relay is lighting up this is how to control relay and we can also control we can control dc voltages but we can also control ac voltages how do relay work here i've opened I removed the cap of one of the relays and what you can see inside is these metal pieces and whenever I activate the relay we see that this metal piece goes up and down. What is happening is that this piece here is connected to the common pin. The top pin is connected to the normally closed pin and then on the bottom which you can hardly see but on the other side here on the bottom, this is this, there's also a plate which is connected to the normally open side. And here, there is a, a solenoid. So whenever I energize the solenoid, we actually pull the tab from the normally closed position to the normally open position. And this is what you can see here when I energize the device. The, uh, the coil and these are how really work so they make really physical contact to uh, to the plates compared to transistors which use semiconductors this is why relays can be used for ac and dc and allow a lot more current because these are physical contacts mechanical relays have some disadvantages and the first one is the sound you've heard it it always makes clicks when it goes on and off and in the attraction this can be very annoying and actually disturbing and removing the effect so i didn't want i didn't like this noise the other part it's again because of the mechanical nature whenever it switches on and off the contacts tear down you can have arcs which uh, degrades the electrical contact between the two plates and simply because it's mechanical it doesn't last that long so around between 10 hundred times and let's say around a million times you can switch it on and off and then it really degrades um but to secure these problems or as alternative to mechanical relays we have something called the solid state relays like this one this is purely electronic and instead of using mechanical parts it uses a triac and this has the advantages at first, it is completely silent and also you can switch it on and off as many times as you want, it, it wants to tear down. So if you want to have some flicker light and not just a strobe which switches off a couple of times in an hour, a second, in a minute, but you want it to switch it very often, this is very useful and it is silent. Now this solid state relay really have some disadvantages, first they cost a bit more money and uh, then they only work with AC because they use triax while these also work with dc and they support less current this one only supports 2 amps and uh, while this one supports 10 amps you can buy even higher current capable uh, solid state relays but at, in the same class range they support less current um, another thing which the solid state really often have integrated is a zero crossing mechanism where actually it switches on only if the input wave crosses zero while these one don't have it integrated you can put it uh, uh, you can add it zero cross mechanism on the side or so so you have to do it but very often the tracks come with it included it's not a must but it's very often the case here I've built a small circuit to show you what zero crossing point means, or actually the lack thereof. So in the middle we have the relay. The relay uses this input voltage, AC voltage from this output transformer, which is at 240 volts. 
And this is also where the yellow probe of the oscilloscope is connected, so to whatever this is output, outputting. Then we have the blue probe, which is connected to the output. So whenever the relay is enabled, then we will see the voltage going through uh, at this blue probe and also going through this LED floodlight. And the last bit here is this uh, PVM generator, which only takes care of generating a one hertz signal to enable this relay. The output is also connected to the external trigger, so we can trigger at exactly when the PVM is actually uh, enabling the relay. So let's switch it on. And as you can see, we have the one second, the, uh, one second pulse. And if we look at the oscilloscope, we always see that between the trigger point and the point which actually the relay starts conducting the voltage or conducting current, there's always a slight delay of 5 milliseconds. And this is due to the nature of these um, mechanical relays. It needs to charge the, uh, the coil, so it um, takes the plunger down and makes the contact. So mechanical parts always take a bit of time. But what's important and what I wanted to show here is that it doesn't care at which part of the input waveform is the relays activated. It just activates at 5 milliseconds after to getting the input signal in. And this could be at the point where it, uh, the voltage is at the highest, at the lowest. It just doesn't care. The problem, or actually the, the drawback of this, is that where you can see that the output waveform is quite distorted. This has to do because when it's at the high point or at the low point, you have an Irish current, and this is not very clean. And leave some traces also on the, on the isolation transformer. And the problem is that simply it activates just at any point. It doesn't wait until the input waveform is at zero, so to nicely have uh, current going to into it when actually the voltage is climbing up. And this is a disadvantage of, of one of these relays. Here the same circuit with the solid state relay. And as we can see here, this is the trigger point, so this is when the solid state relay is enabled, but you can see sometimes there's some delay to the waveform. So this, the blue one, is where it starts conducting. And as you can see, the blue one only starts when uh, the yellow one, which is the input, crosses zero. So this is what is called the zero crossing point. And this enables to have not a high uh, inrush current and have some, some clean waves. The same happens uh, when it switches off. It switches off only at the zero crossing point. And this is one of the benefits of this solid state relay. The next thing we need is some way to remotely trigger the light. And for that, I decided to go with infrared remote controls because I accumulated plenty of it over the years. You get them absolutely everywhere. And for this project, I chose this one. This one came with this LED controller, but you can also get it for very cheap by itself. I think less than two dollars. And now we need to find out what codes are sent when we press on the button because we will need to receive them and decode them. How do infrared remote controls work? Well, it is pretty easy. It is just an infrared LED and whenever you press on the button, it sends, it passes electricity to the LED and it makes it blink. This is invisible to the naked eye, but the cameras or camera, CCD cameras are very sensible to infrared light, even if they have uh, a filter blocking most of the infrared light. This is why we can see it on the camera. And this is a good way to check if actually a remote control still has some battery or not. Now, um, physical processes are often reversible, so now we are sending electricity through the LED to make it light up, but we could use it the other way around. What if we send infrared light through an infrared LED, then, as we can see here, we actually can receive the infrared code. So this generates the voltage back, and we can see there are two different codes, but let's get one of them. Here, for example, this is one of the patterns. The issue with that is that it is not very sensible to infrared light and you can see the voltages are not very high and as soon, so here it still works, but as soon as I get further away it doesn't work anymore. Instead of using an infrared LED, what we can use is an infrared phototransistor and you can recognize it because of the black body. Now infrared LEDs will only emit infrared light, this is why we don't need to filter out what is coming out of the infrared LED. Phototransistors will only want to receive infrared light. This is why they have the block body which blocks 
all the light except the infrared. I've mounted the infrared phototransistor here with power coming in and stand on the high side the resistor. And if I now use the remote control and press on a button, we can see the signal is a lot cleaner. We can still see a bit of wiggling inside though, and if we zoom into it, here, we can see the wiggling. This means that actually the light goes on and off at around a frequency of 37 kilohertz. Now there is yet another device which I wanted to show you, and this is this um, photo detector, which I found on, on the USB infrared toy. And this is package a photodiode with some amplification and some comparator. Photodiodes have the advantage that they react very, very fast, a lot faster than phototransistors. You will see the signal difference between both of them once I transmit a signal here. The yellow one is the phototransistor, the blue one is the photodetector based on the photodiode. And if we now zoom into it, we can actually see the modulation and it is at 37 kilohertz again. So this is an important uh, information we have now. The signal which is coming out of it is going on and off at a frequency of 37 kilohertz. And this is very important for, for, uh, for infrared remote control simply because infrared is everywhere. The sun is emitting infrared light and other devices are emitting infrared light. But we only want to receive signals which is coming out of this, um, of this infrared remote control. This is why they modulate it. So using that, if we receive a signal, we can now discriminate the signal. If the signal is modulated at 37 kilohertz, then this is an infrared remote control signal. If it is anything else, we don't want to see it. We don't want to react on it because it could be a sun or anything else. It's just not a remote control. And all remote controls use the same principle. They have a carrier frequency and then on top of which you see here, the, the wiggling signal, and on top of the carrier frequency, they switch in on and off to actually send the bits or to send some, some kind of data. And the first thing you need to do when you have an infrared remote control is figure out what is the carrier frequency for this signal. In our case, it is 37 kilohertz, and actually it is 38 kilohertz. And this is by far the most used frequency, but it is important to figure out how it works, uh, what is the frequency bef before we can go on. This is also why I presented all the devices. The best way is using this photodiode, but th this device is rather rare and expensive. Then you can use phototransistor, they're a bit more sensible. But if it's just about figuring out the frequency, you can use the infrared LED. This infrared remote control came with this LED controller. And here, there is this infrared receiver. You can again recognize it because it is black, so it filters everything out except infrared light. This receiver is called a demodulator and it does exactly what it says, it's demo it demodulates the signal. So it is waiting for an infrared signal which is modulated at a specific frequency, 38 kilohertz. And all I've explained before is important because this demodulator is specific to frequencies. This one is for 38 kilohertz and you can also buy them with for different frequencies and they're very cheap coming for various different frequencies. 38 kilohertz is by far the most frequent one. And I've here put one on the oscilloscope. And now if we look at the signal transmitted, we can see on the top we have the one from the demodulator and on the bottom the one from the photodiode. The demodulator already does the demodulation, we don't care about the modulation in between. This is why we only have on and off. On means that the infrared remote control is transmitting a signal modulated at this frequency, then off means there is no infrared transmission. The advantage of having this compared to this is that it works at very far distances. So this is still decoding. And while this one doesn't work up uh, above 30 centimeters, this one work, works a couple of meters. And this is exactly also what you find in your TV set and so on. These are the infrared demodulator. Now, we've demodulated the signal. We need to, inter we need to figure out which protocol it is using. And for that, we have to look at the waveform. So if we look at it, we see that we have downs 
signal going down. So this is when the infrared signal is transmitted and it is called a mark. Then we have sig when nothing is transmitted, this is called a space. And we have patterns of mark and spaces. The first mark, as we can see, whoop, the first mark is 8 milliseconds long. And then the following space is 4.6 milliseconds or 4.5 milliseconds. The first mark is generally longer because the remote control tells the demodulator here there's a signal coming in, please train to my frequency or, and train to my signal strength so you have then time to decode correctly. And this is why the following bits are decoded correctly. So we have the first mark and space and then we have all the other wiggling and we can see if the oscilloscope is decoding that the bits or the other bumps are around 600 milliseconds, uh, microseconds. So at, at least actually 500, yeah, 600 microseconds. And these are the individual bits. Now you could use any kind of transmission protocol you wanted because this doesn't care about the protocol. It only cares about the modulation. The chip which is behind cares about the protocol, but there are not too many of them. And once you have identified the first timing parameters, you can have a look at which is existing, for example, on the SP website, and you will identify that this remote control is using the NEC protocol, the infrared NEC protocol. And this is very, very frequently used. So 38 kilohertz and the infrared proto NEC protocol is one of the most common cheap re infrared remote controls. Although how other brands can use something else, but you will find it very frequently. And now that we have that, we have all the timings which we need, we have all the bits, we receive the signal, we know the protocol, and we can decode the bits. And with that, we have a remote control for our device. And this is the device. This is everything we need. So here we have the input, which is going almost completely to the socket. But you can see there's a lot of glue because I wanted to have everything fixed together and because we're playing with main electricity, I wanted to protect everything against shorts. Uh, there's a lot of current which can go in there. So here we have actually the neutral going to this socket here. This is earth and then the line is not going directly to the socket. It's actually going, as you can see, it is going here. This is a solid state relay. It is pretty small and it can carry only or switch only two amps. So this pretty much limits to whatever you, to the things you can plug here. You can only th plug in things which are using up to two amps, so which is around 450 watts. So LED floodlights, perfect. They are using 50 watts or 30 watts. So the one I had here was 30 watts. I added some other things here. You can see this is actually a two ampere fuse. So because of the restriction of the two ampere here, I've added a few so nothing can happen in case somebody wants to operate at 500 watts. So for example, if the user doesn't pay attention to the warning here and plugs in something which draws a lot of current, this fuse will blow protecting the whole circuit. On this side here, we have a mains transformer to five volts. Again, I've put a 0 0.5 amp fuse just as protection. It's about mains. I want it to be as safe as possible. And this has just AC input and five volts output. Now we have here the microcontroller, which handles everything, which you can actually even update over USB. And most importantly, on this side, we have a stereo tip ring sleeve socket, which is just 3.5 millimeters. And on the other side, we have the infrared receiver, which actually just needs um, five volt, which are here. The signal output is on the ring and the ground is on the sleeve. So you just have to plug it in here so the receiver can be passed by the microcontroller. Now this is an STM32 microcontroller, an ARM Cortex-M3 running at 72 megahertz. This is a lot too powerful for what we need. It has a lot of peripherals, uh, it is very capable, it can even do USB. So it's an overkill for what we want to do. Here we want just to receive some very slow infrared code and switch on and off a solid state relay. But it all depends on the requirements. This is very cheap. I'm very familiar with this microcontroller. I have a lot of templates 
ready to be used. So I just need to add a bit of code and I can use it. It is also um, big, but we didn't have such a large uh, constraint about the size. So because of the concern of the project, this fits per perfectly the need. We want to have something which works quite well. It is cheap, we don't care about the size, so why not put something uh, more powerful? We don't care if it's too powerful. And with that, we have a strobe controller. I even built a second prototype, well, not prototype, uh, a second strobe controller. So instead of having just one socket, here we have three sockets. So I simply use this power cord, power extension, I don't know exactly how it's called. But yeah, I cut the cable, and here we have everything again. So the 5 volt converter means to 5 volts again with a fuse, lots of glue, so nothing mo moves. The microcontroller board, uh, the infrared receiver. Here we have the 2 ampere fuse to be sure that the user only uses 2 ampere and the solid state relay. And what this allows to do is first switch on and off whenever you want. That's the most important part though, is that you can have three floodlights or any kind of three devices you want to strobe. And this would allow the user or the operator to have some nice effects. So I don't know exactly, it's just one option and the difference is not too big. Um, even if you use two floodlights, you are under the 550 watt rating. So let's see how this works out. So we did use the first strobe controller for the ghost apparition I already showed, but we also made use of the second strobe controller. The remote control has lots of buttons. Some are just to switch on or off the lights, and so others are to create flashes. But then I've added what I've called the flickering mode. And with that, it simply switches uh, on and off the light very rapidly, creating random strobes of light, like if there was some electrical malfunction. And we've put this in a corridor, for two reasons. First, it would give the impression that the corridor is kind of haunted because of the malfunctioning electricity. And then the really short strobe of light flashed the visitors and blinds them for a sh very short amount of time. But this allows us to be hidden in corners and then to appear in front of them so to scare them. So that worked really well. And this flickering mode also takes fully advantage of the solid state relay because you can switch on and off very, very frequently and it is completely silent. Not everything was perfect though. One issue we had was with re infrared remote controls. Infrared LEDs only emit lights at a certain angle and the, re uh, the infrared demodulator only receives light at a certain angle. So if you want to transmit the signal, you really need to point the remote control in the direction of the receiver. So when you're in a ghost costume, it's completely dark and you need to think about your movements and the timing. It's sometimes quite hard to point the remote control to the right direction so you have the strobe of light. So this worked, but it wasn't ideal. It could be improved. And if I would have to build in the strobe controller again, I wouldn't use remote infrared remote controls, but radio remote controls, radio frequency remote controls. Instead of emitting light, it emits radio waves in all directions. So you just have to press the button. This is, for example, a garbage row remote control. Um, which transmit the signal and to receive the signal you can use one of these small modules. You need to be aware of the frequency that they match. This transmit at 433 megahertz, so we need a receiver which only receives at 433 megahertz. And the, the signals are even simpler than what you would receive here because it's just AM modulated a couple of bits. So that doesn't make it a bit, that doesn't even make it more complicated. So you have the advantage of um, pointing in any direction and um, it reaches a couple of meters. And if you want to reach even further, you can even buy a bit longer remote controls with large antennas because the longer the antenna, the further you reach away, rule of thumb. And then what's most important is that you have large buttons. So you don't need to find which button you want to trigger all the time. When you want to operate something really in a timely fashion, this is ideal and I would use this in the next iteration. But the strobe controller we had worked good enough and the aim was to scare people and that, that was really done well and we had great success. So with that, enjoy!